Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about understanding friction in the customer experience. I'm very excited to unpack this one because this is something that I think impacts manufacturers and industry distributors, everybody, that customer friction, right? And we brought in the expert. We brought in Paula Courtney, who is the president at Verde Group. So Paula, how are you doing this morning? I'm excellent. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to have you. Very excited. And this is a topic we haven't covered on Eco Ask Why. So this is one that is, is, is new, it's new ground for us. So very looking forward to this. So if you're in a, in a high school right now and you're explaining this to a group of, of 10th graders, you know, what do you tell them about the customer experience? What, what are you saying in that moment? That's a great question. And I think I'd start by saying when you think about, uh, a store that you went to or a restaurant, uh, could be any business, any organization where you maybe browsed at or you paid for products or services. And then you come home and you think about everything that happened to you at that store or that restaurant. That, that reflection is really a summation of the experience that you had with that organization. So, Really, customer experience is everything that happens to you when you choose to shop or buy from somewhere. It could be as little as, you know, looking at the shelves and seeing the products there. It could be checking out with your purchase, using your credit card. Uh, it could be going online and clicking the shopping cart or browsing for products and comparing prices. It could be the meal that you had. It's all of those things, all of those events, all of those interactions, they are all experiences. And when you sum them up together, you form an opinion about that organization, about that restaurant, that store. And at the end of the day, you make a decision whether you're going to go back again because it was a good experience or you'll decide not to because it wasn't a good experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because you're right. It, it could go one way or the other, usually, right? You're going to remember the good, but so often, I know in our world, uh, the B2B, for instance, you know, it's it, you have to be careful because you want to make sure that customer experience is, is, is seamless, that it flows. And oftentimes, you know, people focus on the negative. So we hopefully we'll get past that, though. Absolutely. I, I am interested in Verde Group in particular, so maybe can you give our listeners a little insight about your mission, what you're trying to accomplish there? Sure. Our goal as an organization is really to help clients, uh, whether they're manufacturers or retail organizations, pharmaceutical companies, help them improve the experiences that they create for their customers so that customers buy more. Uh, whether it's a physician who's going to prescribe a drug or whether it's, uh, you know, consumers who are going to repeat, increase their basket size or mm. their shopping frequency. Those are the behaviors that we look to promote with our clients. And we do that by helping them understand the experience that matter most, the experiences that matter most and which specific experiences really drive those positive behaviors or mm. which ones put them at risk. Right. And, and speaking of putting the risk, you know, a lot of times I think of, when I think about customer experience, I go straight to friction, you know, and we're trying to get the friction out of the wheel. We're trying to make it, I just think through that Amazon experience that we all are used to, right. It's very seamless. It just is frictionless. It's, it makes it so easy. Sometimes it's too easy. I have to caution myself at night because I end up buying too much stuff sitting in bed before I go to sleep. You know, <laughs> customer experience is great there. So why do you think most businesses know, do you, do you think they really know where that friction lies and, or is that what, where, what you're trying to help them see? So I think that's a, you know, a really important point. I do believe that most organizations know where there are problems. They know the problems that their customers experience. They know where there's friction. Without question, they know. I mean, you can't be in business and not know that there are certain things that go sideways and you know what those things are. I think where many organizations miss the mark, perhaps, is knowing out of the hundreds of experiences, good, bad, and indifferent, that occur on a daily basis, particularly those negative experiences, I think most businesses don't understand which ones really matter, which ones really do drive that negative market behavior. And, and one of the reasons is that 
often the squeaky wheel gets the oil first. Problems that happen with tremendous frequency are typically the ones that organizations A, are aware of and B, are putting money behind. Mm -hmm. But those aren't necessarily the problems that you ought to fix. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. It's like, why not fix the problems that are happening all the time? Because sometimes those are the problems that are distractions in your business and really don't drive customer behavior. They don't make customers buy less from you. They might be annoyances, but the problems that typically don't get invested, don't get attention, are those that happen less frequently, but can cause tremendous collateral damage to an organization. Because when they do occur, customers absolutely do not buy again. They don't, you know, they don't shop, they, they may spread negative word of mouth, and we call those the silent killers. And so what mm -hmm. Verde Group does is we help organizations understand what are your silent killers? What are your problems that you might be aware do happen, but you don't understand the financial risk that's associated with them? Mm -hmm. this, I mean, the silent killers, I think from my, from my experience in sales in the past, when you lose an account, there's this window where you think everything's okay. And then oftentimes you don't realize the account's gone because they've made that decision with their wallet months ago. And it, this, to your point, the silent killer is really, that's driven that business away. And it sounds like that's what you're trying to help people understand and lean into versus the, the flaming fire that everybody sees. We know we got to fix that part of the, of the, of the experience. And I think a good example of that, and I always quote this cause it's hilarious because you know, bank executives will laugh when I tell the story, but in banking, as an example, I cannot tell you how many times banks have redesigned statements, uh, believing that, you know, state, because customers call into call centers and they say, I don't understand my statement. I don't understand these charges. So they think if we can just make them more legible, make it clear, use simple language. And yet people don't leave banks because they don't understand the statement. They leave banks maybe because the service charges are there, they're too high, or they were told uh, that they weren't going to charge something and they, they are charged something. So it's really, uh, you know, an, a perfect example of how we're investing in something that we might hear from one of our channels, mm -hmm. your call center channel, and yet it's not something that really creates economic damage to that organization. But we're spending a ton of money redesigning that statement. It's like every year there's a new statement redesign. So I think that's a, a classic example. Nowadays, a lot most digital most banking has gone digital. So, but there's still online statements that are produced. Uh, so that example is still relevant. Oh, it's very relevant for sure. And I mean, do you think through? the decisions to leave a bank that makes perfect sense. And, you know, going back to what you're talking about earlier about the temperature and the silent killers and, you know, focusing on the areas that, that makes the biggest impact, you know, curious, why does that jump out as, mo as most important? You're trying to help businesses understand these friction points right now. So is that, is, is there a reason why you want to go right there to, to get the biggest bang for your buck out the gate? There's so many reasons why, you know, focusing on measuring and managing friction are so important. So the first one is that problem experience is highly predictive of negative market action. I know that's, it's sad, mm. but true that when customers have problems, they actually do something about them. They either, they either stop doing business with you or what we call they freeze. They don't increase their business with you or they fight, they call you, they tell you that this problem is, you know, highly egregious and they want resolution. So there is some activity. It's almost like a problem creates some sort of motivation for customers to do something, but not all problems are created equal. Some create more of that uh, behavior than others. So the second thing why understanding friction is important is how do you know where to invest? If you don't know where it's hurting, how do you know how much you, you should spend to fix a problem? And I think that's really, really important. Most organizations don't have an endless pool of funds where they can address every single problem. There's you know, a cap on human resources. There's a cap on financial resources. So how do you maximize your investments in the right places? So understanding where friction hurts you the most, not fix all the problems, but fix the ones that do drive that negative market behavior. 
are, is really critically important for ROI to maximize, you know, profitability. Mm -hmm. And then the third reason why it's so important is because often understanding problems is a tremendous source of innovation. You can mm -hmm. innovate better products, better go to market service strategies. You could actually create offensive, you know, competitive maneuvers if you understand the problems that your customers experience, because chances are not only are they experiencing them with you, but likely they're experiencing them with, for your customers. So you have, if you have a really solid understanding of the problems that your customers have with you and the ones that really matter, particularly those that don't happen very frequently, and you can innovate around them, then you've got a leg up on the competition. You know, think about Uber, you know, a great innovation. My, a lot of people think, well, that's a, sh you know, ride sharing app. A lot, of, well, Uber will tell you they're a technology, but they've solved a fundamental problem. Taxis were old fashioned. You had to, you know, pay, you have to call, you have to hail it. It's, you don't know when it's coming. And they have solved so many issues with traditional taxis mm -hmm. and, and they've innovated around there. So I think that's a, a, a great idea on how you can really use problems and how people, you know, experience them to innovate for better products, better solutions, for sure. So lots of good money to be made by focusing on problems, for sure. Absolutely. But I'm curious. So, you know, speak to the, to the end user out there, the manufacturer or the industry. How do you get these problems? I mean, how do you understand them? Or do, is it is it voice of customer surveys, feedback? Is it talking one-on-one -on -one with your sales and what their engagements are like in the field with their, you know, with their reps that they're, that they're seeing, the, the end users? So I'm just curious, where does that feedback come from? All of the above. I mean, everything that you just listed off are great sources of customer feedback. Mm. And there are essentially two types of customer okay. feedback, structured and unstructured. So the unstructured feedback is the stuff that you see on social media. It's the interactions that sales reps have with customers. It's the conversations that happen when customers call into a call center. All of that is rich and useful feedback and it's unstructured. So you need a way to structure it. You need a way to quantify mm -hmm. it. And the good news is there's a lot of technology that facilitates the coalition. So of customer feedback and the quantifying, like basically structuring and analyzing a lot of that soft, soft, you know, goopy customer feedback that's out there. And then of course there's still traditional structured survey data collection methods like voice customer surveys, um, whether they're intercepts on your screen or they're, you know, email invitations or annoying telephone calls, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners, you know, try to not answer, right. but those are more traditional ways. And, and I'd say it's getting harder and harder to collect customer feedback in those traditional methods. Now companies are looking for, you know, customer feedback through a lot of social channels. And also mm -hmm. there's an, another way in collecting customer feedback by understanding behavioral analytics. How are customers behaving? What are they doing? How often are they shopping? Uh, what are their patterns for shopping, buying, browsing, screenshots, screen views? All of that data is rich and important to help understand and frame what's really going on with your customers and your business. Mm -hmm. I think, and the behavior analytics and the, the pointing to the data, I think for our industry, I'm seeing it, the trend shifting more and more to that, Paula. And, you know, where as a distributor, you know, we can't just be selling parts and pieces. We need to be coming with solutions, but we also need to be to your innovation point, helping that, that end user innovate. And I think a lot of that's driven by data. And okay, here, here are your patterns. Here's what your historical buys look like. Here's where things you could, you could, you could consider in the future from a, you know, migration standpoint or modernization standpoint. And I think, you know, leaning into the customer experience that way more and more, I think to, to, to really be a front, front, you know, line runner here in the future, you're going to have to be able to do that and speak to data. And I think one of the challenges, Chris, is that organizations have too much mm. data and too little insight. And I think that could be a danger as well. You know, you have 
all this data and it's it's sometimes difficult to take all of that data and discern from it, you know, the wheat from the chaff. Like how do you understand what really matters in that giant bucket of data? Cause it can be overwhelming and, and it's housed typically in different places in the organization. You know, maybe marketing doesn't have access to operational data and maybe what's happening in your supply chain is, is blind to you. Maybe you're an intermediated business and, you know, what's happening at the end customer line of sight is invisible to you because they buy through dealers. Mm. And so there are a lot of complexities and challenges with data, both, you know, being blind spots and also having too much of it and not being able to analyze it effectively from all the different places where it resides. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand the challenges. So is there, give some advice. Is there a gold key or anything like that? If we're trying to help these customers with innovation and we're trying to improve their bottom line revenue, things like that, all the things we're trying to do, you know, is there any red threads, any common points that you point people to? Yeah. So for us, we, we like to say, listen, the most important thing is follow the money. And, and what does that mean? Unless you can connect what customers can, are experiencing what how they're interacting with you with their with their behavior that you can monetize then a lot of that data is superfluous and probably not mm -hmm. necessary so if you're in business to make money then follow the money and that means try to find those direct connections between how customers buy from you what they buy from you how often they buy from you and the things that happen that predict that and that's that would be my first starting ground is follow the money. How do you make it? How do you make more of it? What puts your ability to make money at risk and focus on getting data to help those decisions around mm -hmm. that? I'm curious too, with, with the world we're living in now with the supply chain issues, following the money makes that makes perfect sense. Is there any value though as well as being innovative and, and trying to help these cut these end users, you know, source <laughs> quite frankly you know i feel like here lately whoever can source is, is going to be the winner right so just any anything shifting over the last 12 24 months that you're seeing outside of just following money around the whole sourcing supply chain issues that's a great question we just finished a study with a uh, manufacturer and they uh, basically manufacture fertilizer mm -hmm. so you know uh, maybe not a sexy product, but we very important in That's agriculture. Right. And there are major, major supply issues. And one of the top problems for this organization was lack of supply. And they can't control it. Like it's it's just, you know, phosphate, difficult. I mean, there's supply chain issues to get that product into end customers' hands. And in this instance, the end customer is a farmer. So one of the best strategies for this organization is how can they help growers, farmers manage expectations? How can they manage grower expectations around what they can expect, how much volume, what they see coming down the pike? I mean, the communication channels are critically important when supply chain issues are yeah, at risk. And I'd say that People understand that there are shortages, but they need advance warning. Mm. They need advance notification because they have dependencies. They have, you know, their quotas that they need to meet. They've got, you know, a farming cycle that they need to manage. They need to make alternate arrangements. So the more you can arm your customers with information and foresight on what challenges you might have as a supplier, the better your customers will be and they'll gain trust. They will say, you know what? We knew there was going to be a shortage, but they gave us so much, you know, warning and they helped us. They worked with us. They collaborated with us on what we can do mm -hmm. about it. And, and I think that's really key. So be innovative around your collaboration techniques and be, you know, be an agile communicator and you know, be proactive in your communications with clients. I think that's really key. Because, you know, you can't find something that doesn't exist and you can't change sometimes supply chain issues that are completely out of an organization's hands. But 
can you manage the expectation that your customers have mm -hmm. with you? Control what you can control, right? I mean, that that's it. That's it. Absolutely. I'm curious. So from, from your standpoint, if you're trying to measure this and you're trying to, because customer experience that it, it can be somewhat fuzzy. Are there any metrics or any numbers in general that you can put out there that you, where you can see, Hey, this is going in the right direction. We're, we're making improvements as an organization and here's the data that supports that. Yeah. So I think that there are three key metrics that organizations should always have okay. front and center. Number one is measure friction, the absence or presence of friction. What percentage of your customers are experiencing problems in a typical purchase cycle, which could be six months, it could be annual, but measure the frequency of problems. That's number one. And you want that number to keep going down because the more problems your customers have, the less loyal they will be. Fact, 100%, mm -hmm. that is a fact. The second key metric is the effectiveness of recovery. When customers do have problems and they take the time to contact you about them, how effective are you at resolving that customer's issue? So that is critically important. Measure the effectiveness of your recovery. When customers are completely satisfied with the resolution to their problems, they can sometimes be more loyal than those customers who didn't even have a problem mm. to begin with. So you can actually put a customer in a better place from a loyalty perspective uh, with effective recovery strategies. The third metric, which we think is really important, and it's probably a little more difficult to measure, but still possible, is measure the level of engagement that your customers have with your brand. Are they following you on social media? Are they attending your conferences? Are they uh, you know, signing up for marketing offers? The level of engagement is such an important factor in driving customer loyalty, true authentic customer loyalty. And if you're seeing low engagement, then that means you have risk in your customer relationships and you need to mitigate that. But look for signs that your customers are engaging with your brand. And if you feel there's low engagement, then find ways to engage with your customers, even when you're not selling. So, and you know, there was a great article in, I think it was Harvard Business Review very recently, and it was on the Chinese retail landscape. And this was a brilliant point. Why are the Chinese retailers knocking it out of the park with respect to loyalty and growth, sales growth, et cetera? And one of the reasons is this thing called engagement. They actually keep communicating with their customers even when there's no sale, there's no opportunity to sell. They just want to keep their customers front and center and always looking for a purposeful and deliberate way uh, or reason to engage mm -hmm. with your customers. So I think it is such an important element of driving customer loyalty. So those are my I three metrics. I love, I love that example too, because it's all about serving the customer at all times and just, and being ready to serve. So you know, Paul, this is, I've, I've learned a ton about the customer experience here. I'm sure our listeners have too, but we call it eco why. So we always wrap up with the why. So, you know, why is it important for that customer experience uh, to be so, to be so smooth for success in business in the future? You know, I think it's really simple. Like I said before, because that's where the money is. That's how you make money in your business. Great experiences will create greater profitability, bad experiences will put that at risk. So if you want to protect and grow revenue, you need to deliver an outstanding customer experience. Absolutely. Now, Paula, for, for those that want to connect with you and learn more about Verde Group, where should they go? Our website, verdegroup.com or theverdegroup.com. Either way, we'll get you to the same place. Okay. And we'll sync yes. that up in the show notes for our listeners. Go there, check that out. You, you, you'll be able to connect directly with Paula and her, her team and uh, Paul, this has been a lot of information. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It was, it was a lot of fun unpacking the customer experience on EcoSY. 